Welcome back to Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. And a big thank you to my patrons on Patreon for your contributions to my channel. In the previous video, we discussed the pharyngeal constrictors. So there was a superior, a middle, and an inferior pharyngeal constrictor. And these muscles actually help move a bolus of food from the back of the oropharynx all the way down the pharynx into the esophagus. Now, going back to this anatomy piece that we looked at in the previous video, uh, this right here is the superior constrictor, the middle one's right here below that, and then we have the much larger inferior constrictor. Okay? And they exist on both the right side, as we see here, and the left side over here. This is a posterior view. But what we have here in this picture is, on the left side, those constrictors have been peeled away like the pages of a book. And in the middle line, we have this median pharyngeal raphe, which goes up most of the way. Okay? And it serves to connect the two halves of the constrictors. For example, uh, the middle constrictor over here would be connected to its left half over here by means of that raphe in the middle. But the left side of these constrictors has been peeled away. So we've already looked at the superficial muscles. Now once we peel this away, we can see the deeper muscles within here. And most of these are going to be soft palate muscles. Let's first do a quick review of some of the basic anatomy here. So here's a sagittal section of the front of the skull. So in blue here, we have the nasal cavity, right? This is, of course, the nostril right here. Below the nasal cavity, we have the oral cavity. That's where the mouth is. You can see the upper row of teeth right here. And then between the nasal and oral cavities, we see the palates. Part of the palate. posterior. It's actually largely muscular. And to close the oropharyngeal isthmus during swallowing. So obviously when we swallow and we move food from the oral cavity into the oropharynx, which is actually back here, we don't want that food to be able to move up into the nasopharynx and into the nasal cavity. We actually want the food to go from the oral cavity to the oropharynx and then down to the nasopharynx. We want it to be unidirectional. So let's look at this picture down here to get a better understanding. Okay? So up here, of course, this is the nasal cavity, and here's the oral cavity, and then behind that we can see the pieces of the pharynx. Up here would actually be the nasopharynx. This would actually be the oropharynx, and then down here would be the laryngopharynx, right? And then over here would be the trachea and the esophagus. And in blue here is that bolus of food, right? So as the bolus of food moves posteriorly from the oral cavity into the oropharynx, if this soft palate right here where my mouse is does nothing, then there's a little space there where the food or whatever it is can move from the oropharynx up into the nasopharynx and then ultimately into the nasal cavity. So in picture B here, what you see is the soft palate has actually moved. Notice that it's actually moved and is now pressed against the back of the nasopharynx and oropharynx. And it essentially closes off this passageway between the oropharynx and the nasopharynx and therefore the nasal cavity. So when the soft palate actually elevates, it essentially closes the structure called the oropharyngeal isthmus, which essentially closes off that passageway and prevents food from going into the nasal cavity. Now, as that blue bolus of food moves inferiorly from the oropharynx down into the laryngopharynx and ultimately the esophagus, there has to be a mechanism to prevent food from going through the trachea, right, or at least entering the trachea. Now, the trachea is held open by tracheal cartilages. They're rings of cartilage that sit around the trachea, and they keep it what we call patent. That means open. So the trachea has no appreciable constriction. It can't just constrict and close off to prevent food from going into it. So because of that, the only way to prevent food from going through the trachea is to prevent it from going into it in the first place by essentially putting a cap on the top of it. And that cap is the epiglottis. So right here, this structure right there where my mouse is, it's not labeled yet, but that's the epiglottis. As the bolus of food moves down, it sort of pushes down on the epiglottis. And as it goes down into the laryngopharynx and ultimately down into the esophagus, which is posterior right here, you can see that it's pushing down that epiglottis. And when the epiglottis folds down, it folds down over the opening to the trachea and prevents the food from going down into the trachea. All right. 
and therefore it only has one path, and that's ultimately down into the esophagus, and you can see that right there. Let's now talk about the muscles of the soft palate, the first one being the palatopharyngeus. Anytime you see palato in the name of these muscles, it's going to indicate that it's associated on some level with the palate. It doesn't necessarily mean it attaches on the soft palate. It could be the hard palate. There could be a bony attachment, but it is associated with the soft or hard palates. Now, this muscle in green right here with the star, this is your palatopharyngeus muscle. You can see that it really lives kind of deep or on the inside of the middle and inferior pharyngeal constrictors that we talked about in the previous video. The origins of the palatopharyngeus are going to be the hard palate, so this is a bony attachment on its posterior border, and also the palatine aponeurosis. Now, this is not something we can see in this picture. Palatine aponeurosis, you can kind of see this little white tissue kind of there behind the uvular muscles right here, which we'll cover at the end of the video. Uh, but if we look here in this picture from the previous video, here's the tongue. And then right down there, you can see the uvula dangling a little bit. And then above that, and kind of continuous with the uvula, we have this palatine aponeurosis. So it turns out that the palatopharyngeus muscle which is actually right here, actually comes down from the palatine aponeurosis right here. Okay, So hopefully that makes sense. Palatine aponeurosis is kind of just behind the uvular muscles right here. The insertions of palatopharyngeus we can see much better. So right here is the tendinous part, and we can see it actually connecting a little bit with the posterior border of this thyroid cartilage. And then also it's going to blend with the contralateral palatopharyngeus over on this side. Now, it doesn't seem much like it does that, but if we remember that these two sides have been peeled away from that median pharyngeal raphe, and so if we imagine kind of folding them back to each other, then that would sort of connect the outside of this palatopharyngeus with the outside of the other, and they would kind of blend together, all right? Now the action of palatopharyngeus is to elevate the pharynx. Technically it does so both anteriorly and medially, but the basic idea is pharyngeal elevation. One of the major actions that has to occur during swallowing is elevation of the pharynx up towards the oral cavity. If you put your fingers on your thyroid cartilage, basically your Adam's apple, you're at the level of the larynx, so the pharynx would just be posterior to that. If you then swallow with your fingers on the thyroid cartilage, you'll feel everything move upwards. So not only does the larynx move upwards, but the pharynx does as well. And this is one of the muscles that helps accomplish that. Like the pharyngeal constrictors, the palatopharyngeus is innervated by the pharyngeal plexus, which remember from the previous video is mostly cranial nerve 10, the vagus nerve, but there are some contributions from the glossopharyngeal nerve and the accessory nerve, both cranial nerves 9 and 11. Now the blood supply to palatopharyngeus is threefold. We have the maxillary artery by virtue of the greater palatine artery, the facial artery through the ascending palatine artery, and the ascending pharyngeal artery through the pharyngeal branches. Okay, So three different arteries for blood supply to this muscle. The next muscle we're going to look at is the salpingopharyngeus, which you see here in green with the star right there. Obviously much smaller than palatopharyngeus. The salpingo in the name refers to the eustachian tube or the pharyngotympanic tube. Anytime you see that prefix, that's what it means. So you can tell that one of the attachments is going to be on the eustachian tube. So for salpingopharyngeus, the origin, well, is the eustachian tube. Uh, right here, remember from our anatomy in the previous video, this is the eustachian tube's cartilaginous part. And so that's going to be the origin of salpingopharyngeus. You see the muscle actually move inferiorly, and it actually blends with the palatopharyngeus on the same side. So here's your left palatopharyngeus, and the salpingopharyngeus actually blends with that. And so when it pulls the insertion towards the origin, it's pulling the palatopharyngeus upward, which that muscle is already elevating the pharynx, and so this muscle also assists with elevation of the pharynx by virtue that it pulls the muscle up that is pulling on the pharynx, right? Now this muscle, is also innervated by the pharyngeal plexus, the same as the palatopharyngeus, and its blood supply is also the same as the palatopharyngeus. Maxillary artery, facial artery, and ascending pharyngeal artery by virtue of these three branches. The next muscle we're going to look at is this one in green over here on the left side with the star. This is stylopharyngeus. 
Now, based on stylo, you could probably tell what its origin is going to be. Yes, its origin is the styloid process, which is actually way up there. Now, as we go down from the styloid process, notice that the superior and middle pharyngeal constrictors right here actually lie deep to the stylopharyngeus. So they're actually on the inside, but that's why we don't see this green muscle going down, because these upper constrictors are actually deep to it and are covering it in the picture. But as soon as we get down to the inferior constrictor right here, now the inferior constrictor is superficial to the stylopharyngeus. Okay? And then the stylopharyngeus actually goes um, superficial to the palatopharyngeus right here. And once it gets to the palatopharyngeus, it kind of bifurcates, and it's going to have two major insertions. Okay? One is going to be the lateral glossoepiglottic fold. So right here, kind of on the border of the epiglottis, this is the lateral glossoepiglottic fold. Okay? That's going to be one of the insertions. It's also going to insert on the posterior border of the thyroid cartilage. You can see this component here going down to blend at the posterior border of the thyroid cartilage. Okay? Uh, and then also, this muscle is blended with the pharyngeal constrictors. Uh, you can see how it's blended up here with the superior and middle ones and then also here with the inferior constrictor. Okay? Now the actions of stylopharyngeus are going to be to elevate the pharynx and the larynx during swallowing. The reason this muscle is better at elevating the larynx than the others is because it has a much stronger attachment on structures of the larynx. Okay? It is true that the palatopharyngeus does insert on the thyroid cartilage, uh, but again, it's attaching more, you can see here, on the constrictors, helping to pull those upwards. Whereas the stylopharyngeus has most of its attachments on structures in the larynx, like this glossoepiglottic fold, the thyroid cartilage, so the larynx moves up uh, by virtue of this muscle, among others. Now, up until this point, every muscle here has been innervated mainly by the vagus nerve. Uh, it did have the contributions from 9 and 11, but mainly cranial nerve 10, the vagus nerve through the pharyngeal plexus. This is going to be our first exception, the stylopharyngeus. The innervation of this nerve is mainly through cranial nerve 9, the glossopharyngeal nerve. And the next muscle will also see an exception to that rule. The blood supply to stylopharyngeus is through the ascending pharyngeal artery through pharyngeal branches. Now, over here, this green muscle, remember we said this was the right palatopharyngeus. We have a couple muscles here that actually blend with it. One is this one coming from the cartilaginous part of the eustachian tube. That's our salpingopharyngeus. If we look at this muscle back here that actually has an attachment on that muscle, a little bit anterior to the salpingopharyngeus, that's our next muscle, and that is levator veli palatini. This one over here on the left side is not the same muscle. Okay, We're only looking at on the right side here. That is levator veli palatini. This muscle has several origins. One is on the temporal bone, specifically the petrous part, uh, but it also has attachments on the eustachian tube, again, that cartilaginous part. So if we look at the origin up here, up here, this is really the temporal bone attachment. And then over on this side, uh, the medial side of the origin, this would actually be the component that attaches on that cartilaginous part of the eustachian tube. Okay? And then as it goes down, it's going to insert not only on the palatine aponeurosis of the soft palate, but it also is going to blend with the palatopharyngeus muscle, which I don't have indicated there. Okay? Now, its action is going to be soft palate elevation. Obviously, if it's attaching on the palatine aponeurosis, it's going to be able to elevate the soft palate. But also, by virtue that it clearly blends with the palatopharyngeus muscle, it's also going to be able to pull that muscle upwards and, again, help pull the pharynx upward as well. But the main function of levator veli palatini, as the name suggests, levator palatini, is to elevate the soft palate. That's what you should associate this muscle with. This one is also innervated by the pharyngeal plexus, and its blood supplies via the facial artery, that is, the ascending palatine artery. Now, this muscle over here on the left, this is tensor villi palatini. On the right side, this was the levator villi palatini. And in order to really see the tensor villi palatini, we had to remove the levator villi palatini from the left side. So we basically took this muscle, removed it, and then you can see the anterior tensor villi palatini muscle. The tensor villi palatini muscle is going to originate off of the pterygoid process, specifically the scaphoid fossa. Uh, 
the spine of the sphenoid bone, and also the membranous wall of the eustachian tube, or the pharyngotympanic tube. Like the levator pili palatini, it's also going to insert on the palatina ponderosus. And in general, what it's going to do is it's going to tense the palatina ponderosus, and it's actually going to help to open up the pharynx. So not only do the constrictors have to constrict to move the bolus of food down the pharynx, but there also has to be some opening of the pharynx okay, in order to actually help move the food into it. And so that's going to be assisted by the tensor vili palatini muscle. Like the stylopharyngeus, this one is not innervated through the pharyngeal plexus. This is actually innervated by the nerve to medial pterygoid. Remember the pterygoids are one of the four major mastication muscles, those being temporalis, masseter, and the medial and lateral pterygoids. All four of those muscles are innervated by the mandibular nerve, V3, one of the three main branches of the trigeminal nerve, cranial nerve 5. And so from that trigeminal ganglion, we have the mandibular nerve, the motor part, and that gives branches to the four muscles of mastication, one being the nerve to medial pterygoid. Or there's a branch of that nerve that then goes to the tensor vili palatini muscle. Okay, so out of all of these muscles, the only two that are not innervated by the pharyngeal plexus are the stylopharyngeus muscle, which is glossopharyngeal nerve, and tensor vili palatini, which is uh, ultimately from the mandibular nerve V3, but specifically nerve to medial pterygoid. Now, the tensor vili palatini muscle has blood supply from the maxillary artery via the greater palatine artery, and also the facial artery via the ascending palatine artery. Next muscle is the palatoglossus. Now, when you see the term glossus, that implies that one of the attachments is going to be on the tongue. We might speculate that this muscle runs between the palate and the tongue, and we'd be right. That's this green muscle here with the star. So palatoglossus actually originates uh, from the palatina ponderosus of the soft palate, and it actually runs to the tongue, that is the lateral margin of the tongue. And it's actually going to blend with the intrinsic muscles of the tongue, which reside in, inside the tongue. Okay? Now the extrinsic muscles of the tongue, we can see those as well. It's worth review. This one is styloglossus because it goes from the styloid process to the tongue. We have the hyoglossus right here that runs from the hyoid bone up to the tongue. Then we have the genioglossus right here, which ultimately runs from the inside of the mental region all the way up to the tongue. And then over here we have geniohyoid, which runs again from the inside of the mental region to the hyoid bone. The action of the palatoglossus right here is to one, elevate the tongue. So if you close your mouth and swallow, the tongue actually goes up a little bit. And that also helps to narrow the oropharyngeal isthmus. Remember, we don't want food going from the oropharynx into the nasopharynx. Elevating the soft palate helps with that, but we also want to narrow the oropharyngeal isthmus, and that's part of the job of palatoglossus during swallowing. Again, this muscle innervated by the pharyngeal plexus, and its blood supply is via the facial artery through the tonsillar artery, and now we have a different one, external carotid artery via the lingual artery. This is the only muscle in this group that's actually uh, supplied through the lingual artery. The last muscles we're going to look at are those associated with the uvula, and those are the musculus uvulae. So first of all, right here, these muscles are the levator vili palatini muscles, right? Behind that would actually be the tensor vili palatini muscles. Here you actually see the pterygoid hamulus, and over here coming down, this would actually be palatopharyngeus, right? Palatopharyngeus. Here would be the right palatopharyngeus. And then right here, we actually see the musculus uvulae. Okay, there's the musculus uvulae. Now the origin of the musculus uvulae is going to be the hard palate, specifically the posterior nasal spine of the hard palate. And the insertion is really just going to be the submucosal tissue of the uvula, okay? The action of these muscles is to elevate and retract the uvula, in particular during speech and during swallowing. Okay, We'll get back to that in a minute. And these muscles are innervated by the pharyngeal plexus, mostly, of course, by cranial nerve 10. That's very important, especially for this muscle to understand. Now, when we look at the musculus uvulae, uh, as compared to the levator palatini, which is clearly two muscles on either side, left and right, Really, the musculus uvulae is just one muscle in the midline. It's a midline muscle. So there's not really a left musculus uvulae or a right musculus uvulae. But when we look at the innervation, we could think of this muscle as being split in half down the middle, where even though it's one muscle, we have the left half of it innervated by the left pharyngeal plexus and the right half of it innervated by the right pharyngeal plexus. 
This is extremely important when you're checking for dysfunction of the vagus nerve, cranial nerve 10. So you've probably been to the doctor's office or even in a PT office and they'll have you open your mouth and say, ah, what are they checking for? Now when a person swallows or when their mouth is open and they say, ah, basically they're talking, the uvula should elevate and retract. And there should be equal pull towards the left and equal pull towards the right. And so the result is the uvula should be directly in the midline. Now, if a person has their mouth closed and they're swallowing, you obviously can't check the uvula, which is why this is always done with open your mouth and say, ah. But if the uvula was in the midline, well, then there's probably no problem with the vagus nerve. So if it's in the midline, you rule down vagal damage or dysfunction. But in this case, we can clearly see that the uvula is deviated one direction. And so anytime there's uvular deviation, that probably means there's vagal dysfunction, and the uvula is gonna deviate away from the side of damage. So in this case, they open their mouth, they say ah, they look inside the mouth, and their uvula deviates toward their right. This is right deviation. Well, remember, the uvula deviates away from the side of damage. So it's deviating away from the left, so that means there's probably some kind of left vagal dysfunction. So if it deviates right, you're looking at left dysfunction. If it were to deviate left, you're looking at right dysfunction. So in this case, we're thinking left vagal dysfunction. And that could be a number of things, not just these two things. It could be specifically vagus nerve damage on the left, or it could be an infarct or some other dysfunction of the left medulla. Remember, the medulla oblongata is where the nuclei are of the vagus nerve. And so if there was a tiny infarct or maybe even some ischemia associated with the posterior inferior cere cerebellar artery, the pica, there might be some of this that you observe because if the medulla isn't getting enough blood, it's a little bit starved, there's gonna be some dysfunction with those nuclei on one side, and therefore there's gonna be some dysfunction with the vagus nerve on the same side, and you might actually see this, okay? So we're probably not talking about a full-on stroke. If a person's having a full-on stroke, there's gonna be a lot of other things, not just uvular deviation. But if there's maybe a small region of ischemia or maybe a tiny infarct, yeah, we might be looking at something like this, okay? But that's one of the ways you can screen for vagus nerve dysfunction, and in a future video, we'll also look at the gag reflex, which is also associated with the vagus nerve and also cranial nerve nine. So what have we seen so far? We've looked at all the major muscles involved with getting a bolus of food from the mouth, ultimately down through the pharynx and into the esophagus. Now, to be fair, we didn't really talk a lot about uh, getting food specifically from the end of the pharynx into the esophagus because that involves something called the upper esophageal sphincter. And all the details of the esophagus will be working out in actually the next few videos, so make sure to join us there. But hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of the major muscles associated with the palate. Thanks for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff.